His kingdom is forever. Welcome this homecoming weekend. A special welcome to Amy and Patrick Fada. He called me out of darkness into the light. Though I was lost and weary, he gave me new life. God's own possession, a chosen one, made possible through the blood of his son. I am chosen by God to be his child. What an honor to know the King of Kings and what a privilege to answer to his calling. I am a chosen child of God. I choose to live with joy in struggles of life and I choose to understand by faith and not by sight how can I choose anything less for him for when he chose me I was drowning in sin I am chosen by God to be his child what an honor to know the King of Kings and what a privilege to answer to his calling I am a chosen child of God chosen by God to be his child what an honor to know the king of kings and what a privilege to answer to his calling i am a chosen child of god Certainly it is a great privilege to be a child of God and to know even a, a taste of the riches that we have in Christ Jesus. And living in this fallen world, oftentimes life tends to throw us to and fro and the trials that we bear can become overwhelming to our hearts. And yet we have been given such an incredible gift as believers in Christ the ability to call upon his name, particularly in our hour of need. The name that saves, the name that is above all names. Jesus Christ is Lord, he is Savior, he is Master, he is all and in all, and yet he is hearing our call, answering our prayer according to his perfect will. I open our second reading. <clears throat> From 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 50 through 58, let us continue to listen to God's Word. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability, 
And this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Here ends God's lessons and readings. Thanks be to our Father in heaven. Be my all, be my all, let my satisfaction lie in you. in worldly things searching for joy all in vain wanting those things I do not need calling you only when there's pain Lord you are my strength Forever with me, all I need you, and you alone to be, be my all, be my all, let my satisfaction lie in you, be my all, be my all. Make me complete in you. How can I find peace in all that surrounds me? How do I show them all that you are? If I could just see past this wall of me, I would look so far Lord you are my guide forever with me how I want you and you alone to be be my all be my all let my satisfaction lie in you make me complete Christ make me complete in you certainly we are complete in Christ Jesus and he has called us to be immovable to be steadfast be abounding in faithfulness and to work toward the good of his kingdom. Life is so very, very short, isn't it? It says in scripture that we are but a breath. It is fleeting, and yet we know that our toil is not in vain, for we have been crucified with Christ and raised with him, and someday we will be literally 
before his throne in his presence, and I know that our earthly minds cannot comprehend this. It seems unbelievable at times, and yet our Savior is one who has conquered death and sin and also our unbelief. He has planted within us a seed of faithfulness that says, this is true. I am who I say I am. And we can work diligently for who he is in this life, knowing it is not in vain, until he calls us home. Just several years back, my 44-year-old brother was out on a soccer field and collapsed instantly home with the Lord. We know not the length of our days. We do not know when he will be calling us home. But we can be faithful. We can be steadfast. Paul tells us in Colossians 3, if therefore you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Patrick, Amy, you have painted such beautiful pictures. Thank you. Bow with me in prayer, please. Father, lead us like a shepherd. We await your coming and your promise of glory, knowing we are your children. If for any reason we're not truly aware that you are our personal Savior and King in this life and in the next, make us realize this today, and we ask for recommitment. And for those who don't know you, as their Savior. May they know you now. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not die, but we will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. The mystery is unfolding right now, in front of us today. We are those people, and today we honor homecoming in our past, our present, and our future, knowing we look to Jesus, our cornerstone. I was asked to preach this day on the past, present, and future of this prestigious church. A church that has awaited Christ Jesus, our Lord, coming for over 172 years of service, as has the Church Universal since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It might be simple to say, the Van Wert First Presbyterian Church was founded June 10th of 1843, but a little more complex to portray the era. Several families in Van Wert, Ohio, making up 12 people, met at the log cabin courthouse to establish a church within a village of 40 log cabins and a single framed house. The transportation system was yet to be developed beyond a couple of horse trails. 
This inhibited conventional freight, such as basic luxuries like a cast iron stove. Men were still in need to waste deep swamp mud within Putnam County attempting to complete the Miami and Erie Canal. Presbyterian church services continued at the courthouse until 1847. From there, services were held twice a month at the Methodist Episcopal Church at Jackson and Jefferson Streets. In 1852, a horseback circuit riding Reverend Thomas Elcock became the church's first regular pastor. At Reverend Elcock's prompting, a lot on the southwest corner of East Main and South Harrison Street was purchased and the first Presbyterian church with Van, within Van Wert was constructed. The original structure still stands today. By 1863, the first Presbyterian church was debt-free. As membership grew, a portion of the members successfully promoted the construction of a new church. Land was purchased at the southwest corner of South Washington and West Crawford, with construction occurring in 1873. This was prior to the era of more solid building materials, such as concrete foundations. In addition, the elevation of the church was close to the height of Washington Street, just a block from Town Creek. Years later, the building was subject to the flood of 1913. During the second year of Reverend James Gordon's 22-year tenure, the church installed a grand pipe organ in 1892. Membership grew during these years. Various new programs, including the choir, successfully competing in musical contests with other communities. Some of the membership even became personally involved in mission work within China. During Reverend John Christie's 1912 to 1918 tenure, fundraising for a new building was started in 1916 to meet the needs of an expanding membership. Land was purchased adjacent to the church. However, with World War I breaking out in 1917, the project was postponed. Reverend Dr. George Arthur France served from 1918 to 1926 with Finance Committee in 1920 again focusing on a new church building. The committee wrote a letter to the congregation re regarding the reasons for abandoning their building. The structure had been condemned by the state inspector because of the condition of the main walls of the church. Members felt unsafe because of the condition of the building since the damage from a February windstorm and a workman re having refused to work on the roof because of the unsafe condition. Dr. France toured European cathedrals during his summer vacation and played a major role in the 15th century Gothic design of our current building. Within their church having been condemned, it was raised in 1922. For three years, members of the First Presbyterian Church held services within the YMCA. Boy Scout Troop 35 was organized while at the YMCA. The initial construction company contracted to build the church went into bankruptcy. In the aftermath, refinancing had to be arranged and material shortages contended with. The diligence of the membership then came into fruition. The initial general contract was for $132,000. Compare that amount with their budget a few years earlier. The initial picture is of the area where our furnace room, library, stage, and kitchen are located. Note the sump pump on the closest wagon. The second picture reflects men with shovels and horse-drawn wagons hauling out the dirt. The residence in the background was the church manse up until the 1950s, later being used by church youth, youth groups, and in the late 1970s was torn down, later making way for a small parking lot. On June 14, 1923, Anna Alcock, youngest daughter to our first pastor, Thomas Alcock, laid to the Glory of God 1922 cornerstone of our church. In this picture, our rain gutters are yet to be constructed on the inner side of the masonry walls. The picture also reflects that the steel roof beams were initially inverted downward to support a temporary floor during the construction of the upper masonry. One of the most interesting things within the photo are the two temporary wood arches used in the construction of our current freestanding arch stonework at the front of our sanctuary. This picture shows similar wood structures were used on the crest of our side Gothic windows. Note the upper temporary floor was the below the peak of the side windows. 
The vent displayed in this photo contains three shafts extending to the basement. One was a chimney where the water heater flew. The large shaft was for fresh air exit. And the third was a drain after condensed water drained out of the end of a steam pipe just under the roof gutters which was used to thaw ice. One of the most amazing technologies of the, uh, technologies of the day was a crane which had set within our front yard. It was impressive that it could reach the top of our steeple and there were always those daredevils who would show off for the camera. This picture is of the crane raising a portion of the church roof framework. Rather than welding joints, rivets held the joints similar to World War I era shipbuilding. Note the garage or former residence that would have been located on the current front yard of the church. These beams are still visible in the attic today, supporting the wood sanctuary ceiling and slate roof of our church. Our attic has a two-foot wide catwalk at the peak of our ceiling, the length of our sanctuary. Within the background of the primary chimney construction, note the church steeple at Crawford and McKibben Streets. Kenneth B. Edwards was the youngest front row individual of these construction workers. Kenneth's grandson is Tom Bartz, whose career was at the Van Wert Police Department. With the experience of the flood of 1913, the grade of dirt around our completed structure reflects the flood prevention concerns of that day. Note the translucent panes of glass prior to our stained glass windows and the appearance prior to the Bonniewitz light fixtures. Along with the construction came the church debt. Our current older members knew some of these individuals, and for some they were family. The three panes within the church doors signify the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. After the building construction came the furnishings. The length of our pews were adjusted from the former building and were used in our present structure until 1953 when an unnamed individual donated our current pews. The holy table and other pieces within the chancel were produced by the world's most famous ecclesiastical woodcarver, Eloise Lang. The reed doer's can canopy of the table signifies the burning bush, the Lamb of God, and the cross and crown. The outer panel's background signify grape and vines representing the body and blood of Christ. The center is a rose, a symbol of love and beauty. What was originally a room for the younger children later became the church parlor and in 1953 was named the France Room in honor of Dr. France. The chancel windows were part of the original church dedication in 1925. The next earliest windows are located on the west half of the south wall around 1927. Member Bob Exline tells of the family story of his grandfather hauling some of these windows from the Artolan Wright Studio in Cleveland, Ohio within the rumble seat of their Maxwell automobile. During the 1930s, there were years of struggles to make interest payments. In 1943, the church held a membership of 660 at the 100th anniversary of the church. The $300,000 of debt being paid off and sanctuary stained glass windows being completed was part of the celebration. The most notable window is the one above our balcony, which was constructed in 1940. Cloetta Reed's book, Henry Keck Stained Glass Studio, contains a quote of this window being the largest and finest set of windows the Syracuse, New York studio ever produced. Just as amazing as the appearance of the window is the story this window symbolizes of the church triumphant. The window displays the joy of Christians everywhere while it enhances the visual of Christ's bride, we his chosen, victorious, as witnessed in the window from the last book of the Bible, Revelations. Although most of the stained glass windows were completed after Reverend France had moved to his next church, his earlier planning was instrumental in the theme of which each stained glass window later portrayed. Our last window purchase was in 1956 for the Scott Chapel, completing our Keck windows purchases. The planning for our church's largest renovation occurred in 1945. 
the high water reservoirs of the early toilets were replaced by more modern ones along with much of our current tiled flooring. Ongoing echoes within the building were a serious distraction to listening during the first years of the church. After a reverberation study, scaffolding was set up in 1946 to paint the sanctuary walls along with installing the long-awaited sound-absorbing ceiling tile within the sanctuary and other areas of the church. In 1949, an Allen electronic organ was donated to the church when the prior one became unreliable. Our current organ was installed in 1970. Between the center council, blowers and pipes, the assembly is within five distinct rooms in large closets. In 1992, all of the stained glass windows were removed, flattened, and repaired. In conjunction with the 1993 150th anniversary of our church, an addition was placed on our building. The office was moved from the current choir room. The pastor study moved from our current youth director's office and our building was made handicap accessible with an elevator, restroom, and hallway ramp to the fellowship room. The more recent renovations include a new heating and cooling system along with a long-awaited parking lot. Our building has aided in the many missions within our church. Community youth have learned of Jesus through Wednesday after-school programs, Bible school, and other youth programs. In addition to the vibrant scouting programs in which we provide support, AA and other programs have also benefited in addition to the music programs and worship goes on within our building. Most of all, for many of us, our church is a place where we find the most solace to open our hearts to God and feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. church is when I came here for Christmas, the Christmas Eve service, and I thought it was beautiful with all the lights. It was the best day of my life. My favorite church activity would be um, helping out with the gym. It's a lot of fun. The daddy daddy dance. Learning about God.
like music? Bringing friends. My favorite memory of jam was getting to see all my friends. That we talk about God. My favorite thing about the church is how everybody is so nice to everybody and everybody. And um, you, the church really welcomes newcomers and takes them in under their wing.